Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thanks so much for checking us out again and seeing what God has put on our hearts to share with you today. Before we get started, I just want to remind you, if you want to continue on and following our ministry, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and then also share it with with as many people as possible. You can also follow us on on Facebook and also on our website at fbcac.org, where we're trying to put out as much content as possible to feed you, to fill you, as you want to become more like Jesus and glorify God with every aspect of your life. Now, we're about to get into the Word of God, so sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and I hope you enjoy our, and are edified by the Word of God proclaimed. God bless you, and we love you. I want to begin with uh, some very glaring facts to consider this morning. Uh, a former president of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences, as well as uh, historians from England, Egypt, and Germany, as well as India, have come up with these, with these startling facts. They've um, compiled a, a record of human history uh, going all the way back to 3600 BC. So since, since 3600 BC, so that would put us around uh, 5,600 years of human history, the world has known only 292 years of peace in those 5,600 years. During this period, there have been 14,351 wars, both large and small, in which, get this, 3.64 billion people have been killed. The value of the property destroyed would pay for a golden belt around the world, 97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. It's one heck of a belt. Uh, since 650 BC, there have also been 1,656 arms races, and only 16 of those have not ended in war. The remainder ended in the economic collapse of the countries who were involved. Some pretty gloomy uh, statistics. Over the past four weeks, we've gotten to know Jesus through testimonies, right? Through history, through records compiled by Luke and have framed that information, um, that, that record that he gave us through the lens of Isaiah's prophecy, right? Isaiah 9, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. We've, we've seen how this prophecy, which remember, it was made 700 years before the life of Jesus, is miraculously filled in the life of Jesus. He is the expected king who brought light to a dark world. That's what Isaiah 9 is all about. A world that hadn't heard from God, keep in mind, for 400 years. 400 years of silence from God, and now this Christ child brings the light of God back onto the scene in one miraculous event, right? Through the birth uh, of, a, of a son to a virgin. And it was this child who came to rule and reign as king. So it's this king who is our wonderful counselor, as we looked at in week one. It's God's wisdom in Jesus that we get to, to see him as this wonderful counselor who helps to direct our steps, right? Who helps to guide our lives. This king is also our mighty God that we worked uh, looked at in week two. He is our he's our our hero, our champion God, right? He's the one uh, who who won the victory over sin and death, and we get to now enjoy his spoils of war by being found in him, by being in right relationship with our hero God, with El Gabor. And then uh, last week we looked at how the King Jesus is like this everlasting Father. To us, right? He he protects and provides for us. He helps us prepare for the future, just as a good father would do for his children. But today, we're going to look at Messiah Jesus, finally, as Prince of Peace. But wait a minute, you might thinking, you might be thinking, did did God not get the facts that I just shared with you? Right? Is he ignorant of the fact that the world has been in peace only eight percent of the time? over the last 5,600 years, right? How can we call Jesus the Prince of Peace in light of that statistic? That doesn't seem to make sense. Better yet, how can you and I call Jesus the Prince of Peace in light of the fact that many times in our own lives, maybe even like right now where you're at in your life, we haven't been experiencing much peace. 
whether it's in our society or whether it's in our families or our communities, right? Relationships have been bruised and have been broken. That brings a lot of unpeacefulness in our lives. Maybe your job stresses you out. There's no, stre- there's no peace when it comes to what you have to do on a daily basis. The current fears of the world have gripped the hearts and the minds of so many people that they live by fear daily of what might happen to them or their loved ones. There still seems to be a lot of fear and anxiety and unrest for there to be a prince of peace who is actually rule and reigning. If he is, he must be a crummy ruler, right? I mean, it doesn't seem to make sense. Well, this morning I want us to consider something different. Consider even um, what we looked at two weeks ago in Luke's gospel where Jesus said, I came not to give peace, but what? To bring division. Did he disqualify himself from being the prince of peace? So as we finish out looking at Jesus through the lens of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we will see how actually Jesus does fulfill this prophecy of being the Prince of Peace perfectly. You see, all four gospel letters um, tell of a story of Jesus' Last Supper with his friends. You guys are well familiar with the Last Supper. Uh, Maybe you've seen it in movies or you've seen the painting. Uh, We're well-versed with those events, right? And John's gospel in particular gives us like the fullest look at that supper, at that time that Jesus had with his, with his friends. After making the bold claim by establishing that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he then talks about how he's going to leave them, right? He's going to prepare them for a time when he's no longer going to be with them in the physical sense and how they can start to prepare now. And he says this to them in, in John 14, 25 through 27. He says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Why would they need to be remembered? Or why would they need to be reminded of what he taught them? Why? Because their circumstances will cloud their memory. Have you ever been there? Have you done that? Like you you go to church on Sunday, you hear a great word, right? And then all of a sudden Monday, you've totally forgotten what the sermon was about. Why? Because life got in the way. Because circumstances got in the way. Because you get so consumed with your life that sometimes you have to be reminded, wait, what did I learn just 24 hours ago, right? The same thing is with the case with these guys. That the Holy Spirit will teach them all things and bring to their remembrance all that Jesus said to them. And then he says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You see, Jesus left his disciples with his peace that only he himself could give them. Sometimes it's, um, it's, this, it's this peace of, of what we think to be like a, a ceasefire, right? Like that's not what peace, the, the peace that Jesus was talking about. But sometimes we consider, well, that's peace. As long as there's no fighting. There's no, there, there's peace in the world, right? Or there's peace in my family. There's peace in my marriage. There's peace in my friendships. But a ceasefire is just that. Those two sides could still be really mad at each other. Those two sides could still be building tension. Those two, sti- those two sides could still want to have it out with the other side, right? But they've agreed upon a ceasefire. Or often the world's version of peace is seeking a state of comfort and convenience, right? making my circumstances seem peaceful because why? Because they fit my own goals and my own desires and my own wants. And so it seems like I am at peace in those moments, but none of those versions actually offer peace. You see the biblical definition of peace in your outlines, peace is simply reconciliation. That's what peace is. Peace is reconciliation. And the biblical definition of reconciliation is to bring together two sides that were formerly at odds with one another and to bring them together in harmony, in peace. That's what reconciliation is. Not that just we're just experiencing a ceasefire. That's not reconciliation. Reconciliation is where two formerly warring sides are now willing to set aside their past differences and say, you know what? Our bond of peace is so much more important. We have to stay united 
in this, in harmony and in peace with one another, in which they no longer are at odds with one another. They're actually now one body. They're one in unison. Jesus came to bring this kind of peace. This is the peace that Jesus was talking about. My peace, this kind of peace, is the only peace that I can give to you. He promised it to his disciples 2,000 years ago, and he promises it to us today. And we see this kind of peace play out in a few different ways in your outlines. First, it's with the peace of God. Peace with God. Peace with God. We've heard and we've read the declaration and the pronouncement of peace made by the angelic hosts in heaven many times now over the last uh, four weeks. And let's consider these words um, one last time in 2022 or 2021. In Luke 2.14, let's read this together. Luke chapter 2 verse 14 says this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. What a beautiful announcement to a world who needed peace, who knew no peace up until that point. Paul reminds us in in Romans 3 that all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, because of our just innate sin that is within us, we're actually at enmity with God. Okay, that's the state that we're born into. Paul teaches in Romans 8 that those who live by the flesh who just continue to live however they want to live, are actually in a state of hostility between them and God. They are at war with God because they'd rather live by their own rules than by God's holy law, by his perfect law. And that's exactly what sin is. It's doing it my way rather than God's way. That's exactly what sin is. But Jesus offers a way to end that hostility. And it's actually only through him that we can actually do that. Up until Jesus came onto the scene, mankind thought that the only way to have peace with God was through religion and tradition. If I just do enough of the right things according to the law, then I will be right with God. Because it's my religious duty. It's my being a good person that would earn God's peace. And you know what? This idea actually remains pervasive today, even in the church. My religious acts my good deeds, as long as they outweigh my bad deeds, will get me God's favor and peace. But you know what Jesus says otherwise? The incarnate Son of God came to this earth 2,000 years ago to establish the fact that the only way to have peace with God is to be in right relationship with the Son of God. Jesus came to preach the good news of the kingdom. It's a message of peace. He came to do his father's will, which was to give his peace to his followers. And he came to seek and save the lost so that they could find peace. And this was all accomplished on one mountaintop or one hilltop called Calvary. When the perfect and the sinless son of God went onto the cross once and for all as a substitutionary atonement for the sins of the world. And when that happened, we're told that what what happened? The veil was broken. The veil that once separated man and God was now broken in two. And there was no longer a divide between God and man. Man could now have lasting, real peace with God because of what Jesus did. And this peace isn't found through works. It's found through faith. Paul writes in Romans 5.1, he says, Therefore, Since we have been justified by what? By faith. That's what makes us right with God. We have now peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the peace that our hearts long for. This is the peace that every single human being is looking for, whether we know it or not. It's only through peace of God that we can actually find peace, lasting peace, in every other aspect of our lives. Again, so many of the world's systems, so many other world religions and worldviews teach to find peace in a variety of other ways, right? Whether it's through like attaining inner peace, whatever that means. Uh, Peace with nature. Like, hello, have you gone outside lately? Right, it's not very peaceful. But none of these actually offer anything of value, of everlasting peace. It's temporary. If you do find it, it's temporary. It's fickle. It's easily broken. But peace with God is an eternal 
guarantee that no matter what, our lives and our futures and our hopes and our dreams are securely fixed in the hand of God. So no matter what happens in our lives, the peace of God that we find only in Jesus is actually what sustains us. And it's not a quick fix. It's not just a temporary relief. It's not just take two of these and, the, and you'll feel better in the morning, right? No, it's, it's not this fake solution that the world offers. Jesus' time with his disciples during the Last Supper was meant mainly to encourage for the inevitable to come, that he would eventually leave, that he would no longer be with them. He's referring to his death on the cross and then his ascension into heaven. Because of this, because of this loneliness, there was this great potential for anger and for fear and for unrest in their hearts, right? In those times when you feel the most alone, do you feel at peace? Absolutely not. You feel like something within you is warring against your heart and you'll do whatever, I'll do whatever it takes to find peace, to, to fix that loneliness, right? We'll try to fill that void with whatever we can get our hands on in order to fix that unrest in our hearts. But Jesus sought to encourage his disciples, and he summed it all up in John 16, 33. He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Take heart, child of God. No matter what circumstances you might be facing right now, Jesus has overcome it for you. And when you find your rest in him, you get his peace. This leads us to the second way Jesus acts as the prince of peace because it's only through Jesus that we can find peace within ourselves. Peace within ourselves. Even in great tribulation, as Jesus said, in which circumstances seem insurmountable. Have you ever been faced with a situation and you thought to yourself, I see no way out. I see no end to this suffering. I see no solution. Even in those times when we feel alone, we may even feel distant from God. I've been there. And I know many of you have as well. Jesus reminds us that because we have peace, with God, through Jesus, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we as children of God can live in a perpetual state of peace, no matter how we might actually feel. Peace is not determined by how you feel. It's determined by God. And this gives way to our key for today. Key in your outlines is this. You must have peace with God before you experience the peace of God. You see, there's a difference. You can have peace with God. You can be justified through faith and you can live a total life of chaos and just think that that's kind of normal. It's not. <laughs> it's not God's design for us to live in chaos. Peace with God is a prerequisite for us to walk in the peace of God. Whereas we experience peace with God through faith, we can only experience the peace of God through obedience. We must be obedient. This was why, as truly man in the flesh, Jesus could perfectly experience the peace of God. It's because he never departed from the will of God. Never. We're told that Jesus was baptized by John from the very beginning in order to do what? In order to fulfill all righteousness and obedience to the law. Jesus always walked in God's will through obedience. He was perfectly obedient to the Father, and therefore the peace of God never left him. Isn't that amazing to think? Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, during his most agonizing experience up until that point in his life, I'm sure, Jesus was strengthened by the peace of God. We read in, in Luke 24, just a few days ago, we read in Luke 22, verses 41 through 44 this great story. After the Last Supper, he and a couple of his closest friends go into this garden. He withdraws from them, and this is what we read. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, 
if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Isn't that amazing? And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is the God of the universe. He doesn't need an angel's help to strengthen him. Yet in his humanity, for our sake, he entered into the state of dependence on the Father to show us how we are to live our lives. If the Son of God needs to pray earnestly, what does that say about you and me? <laughs> My goodness, why are we not praying earnestly? What was Jesus' mindset that brought him this kind of peace, this great strengthening presence from this angel? What did he say? Father, not my will, but yours. It was living in the will of God that brought Jesus peace in his most dire circumstances. Despite the greatest amounts of pain and distress, even on the cross, Jesus never departed from the will of God. And he therefore knew the peace of God perfectly. That is absolutely amazing. In the year 1555, there was a man by the name of Nicholas Ridley. And he was burned at the stake because of his witness for Christ. That's got to be maybe the worst way to, to die. On the night before Ridley's execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison chamber to be of assistance, to be of comfort. He was a great friend. And he's like, hey, buddy, let's party up like it's 1999. You only got one day to live. Let's do it, right? What is his response? No, Nicholas declined the offer. And he replied that he meant to go to sleep, to go to bed and sleep as quietly as he ever did in his life. This is on the eve of him going to the cross to burn. Because he knew the peace of God, he could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of his Lord to meet his need. Can you and I say that we know the peace of God that well? That even, even if I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get burned, I can still be at peace knowing that I'm in the will of God. Even in extreme persecution, dire circumstances, we can rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of our Lord. But why did Nicholas Ridley experience such great peace? It's because even while he was being persecuted for living in the will of God, he was remaining obedient to Christ's call on every single one of our lives to be a witness to the nations, to spread the good news. And it's living in God's will that will bring you and me the greatest amount of peace in our lives. But it's just that, you see, living in God's will, that's the problem. That's what we actually struggle with. That's when it comes down to our day-to-day -day activities, we struggle with living in God's will. Again, it's, it's either my will or God's will, and they're always at friction, right? When the bank account is starting to look a little too low for my comfort, I will consider crazy things, even if it's outside of the will of God. Like, has anybody thought, just thought, considered about robbing a bank ever? No, never? Okay, I'm the only one. I mean, like, seriously, like, I'm down and out. Like, I remember the days when I, when you would open up your bank account and you, you saw a red number, right? That's, that's very unsettling. Like, how do I have negative money right now? This doesn't make sense. When relationships seem unreconcilable, like there's no way to fix this relationship. When circumstances seem all out of control and everything seems to be falling apart around me and it's just utter chaos, it's in those times that we are so tempted I don't know about you, I am, to just take control. All right, I got this. I got to do something. I got to fix this, right? When we do things our way, even if they're right, they're familiar to us, it can often take us out of the will of God. That's a dangerous place to be. So how do we fight this natural urge and this temptation to do things our way? Because we fight that urge daily for some of us even though it might take us out of the will of God. Well, we follow Jesus' examples of prayer and obedience. So first, peace comes when we pray. When we pray. Peace is the fruit 
of prayer. It's God's design. He designed it to be dependent on him so that we, re we can relinquish every burden that we were not meant to carry and to place it at the feet of Jesus. And how many burdens is that? It's all of them. All of them we're supposed to cast our cares onto the Lord. We're all familiar with Paul's words in Philippians chapter 4, right? That we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do in times of anxiety and stress. Have you guys ever been there? Whenever you're anxious, whenever you're stressful, in all times of stress and anxiety, what, what do you think? Do not be anxious. Well, easy for you to say, Paul, right? What is he say? But in everything, through prayer and supplication, give thanks to the Lord making your requests known to him. And what is the result? And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart in Christ Jesus. And then he says this in verse 8, right after that verse, he says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is prayer. This is meditation on God and his word. We must constantly be training our minds to be fixed on God, to be fixed on his word, because our minds don't naturally go there. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, it, it, that will always be a struggle for my mind to be um, persuaded to go elsewhere. We must fix our minds. Otherwise, we run the risk of letting our minds take control. And our minds will take us to crazy places, dark and dismal places. And then what happens to us? We lose hope. We're more prone to anger and resentment. We're more fearful. We're more agitated. We're more rude and cruel. And it's like, what is, who, who did you know what in their cereal, right? Like, what's, what's going on right now, right? Like, we become more negative. We become more combative. Like, why are you so argumentative all the time? It's because my mind is in a dark place. Because all I think about are crazy things, right? And peace is the last thing on our minds. Yet we're reminded, and this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, Isaiah 26, 3. Just think of this. Let this be your verse for this week. You, speaking of Yahweh, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. The enemy would love nothing better than for you and for me to have divided minds. That's how he wars against us. He seeks to kill and destroy through division. We may think of God for a part of a Sunday morning for a portion of our day, right? But throughout then the rest of the week, our minds are torn between jobs, kids, spouses, family, friends, whatever. We have divided minds. And the more our minds become divided amongst all these things that are, that are important, I'm not saying that they're not important, but the, the more our minds become more divided, the more we actually lose the peace of God. But the promise is simple, and it's true. The more our minds stay on God, the more of his perfect peace I get. Isn't it interesting that it's not the reverse? That, that the more uh, peaceful I feel, the more I'll think about God. That's not how it works. Because so many times we want our circumstances to establish peace before we think about God. And we're putting the cart before the horse. No, no, no. Fix your minds on God and let peace come as a result. But we mustn't just pray, because we've talked about this, and we all know this, because maybe we've experienced this. Prayer, to, like just too much prayer, if I can say that, can actually lead to laziness. It can lead to neglect. It can lead to disobedience, which is our next way to peace. Peace comes when we obey, when we take that step of faith. Peace is simply the result of prayer plus obedience. Prayer plus obedience equals faith. Excuse me, it equals peace. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, right? 
we're supposed to continually fix our minds on those things. We're supposed to pray about them. We're supposed to meditate on them. But we must also act. We must also then obey God's word and walk in faith. I've seen way too many actually like well-meaning Christians miss out on the peace of God because, man, they were so devoted to prayer, but they were unwilling to act. They're like, no, 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 I, I still need to pray about it. No, you don't need to continue to pray about it. You need to now walk in faith. Trust. Trust in the prayer that you prayed. Continue to pray, but now walk in faith. We must obey, not just pray. Prayer must lead to obedience. And this is where Paul gets to in Philippians 4. So again, this whole discourse about anxiety and stress and praying through it and fixing your mind on what is lovely and pure and all that good stuff. After we fix our mind on the, on the things of God, he then completes this teaching in verse 9. He says this, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do what? Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. We must practice, we must put into practice what we read about the word of God. You see, we experience ultimate peace when what we read and pray about in God's word matches up with our lived experiences. That's when ultimate peace comes. Theology and lifestyle now come together in beautiful harmony. And what you believe gets played out in how you live your life. Psalm 119 verse 65 says this, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Isn't that an amazing picture of peace? When, man, I am just in love with God and his word. It's not perfection. It's not sinlessness. It's just love and devotion to his word. What happens? Peace abounds, and I actually don't stumble in life. Isn't that an amazing promise? Like, life can actually get easier and more straight, the path can actually straighten out the more we live in line with God's word. What an amazing reality. When you live out your love of God through obedience to his word, the peace of God that rules our hearts will then affect how we treat others. And ultimately, peace with God and peace within ourselves will lead to, number three in your outlines, peace with others peace with others. You see, peace is not to be hoarded. It's to be shared. So all you hoarders out there, you can hoard your Christmas gifts and all that stuff. Don't hoard peace. Don't do it. God did not send his only son to this earth just so that you and I can personally and, and intimately and individually be reconciled to God and live in peace. So that's just Jesus and us. That's not why he came. This is to be a shared experience in which reconciliation with God is to be experienced through our reconciliation with others. Isn't that amazing? Paul paints this picture perfectly in his second letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, this is what we read. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Okay, that's us. Okay, we are new creations in Christ. If this, then this. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New heart, new motivation, new desires, new way of thinking and living. And what is the result? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He's building something here. That is, he's going to explain what that is. That is, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. That's that picture of reconciliation. And then what? And then entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, what are we supposed to do? We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. God is speaking into a dark world through us, through the church. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is our message of reconciliation to a world who does not believe in Jesus. We implore you, be reconciled to God. Find peace with God through Jesus. If we are in Christ, we are ambassadors of Christ. 
as ambassadors, we are ministers of reconciliation. It's through our example, it's through our words that we help to invite others into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe people around you, like maybe your family or friend groups, don't get Jesus because they're seeing the way you live. They're seeing the way I live, and they're like, that's a stumbling block. It doesn't add up. You say one thing, but you live another. I want nothing to do with that kind of God. So what kind of example can we set as ambassadors of Christ, as ministers of reconciliation? First and foremost, it's an example of love. We must love. Jesus said that the world would know us as his disciples by how we loved one another. They will know us by our love. It's an example of grace. Grace is a free gift of God upon your life. We need to offer that same gift of grace to others. It's through an example of forgiveness. Forgiving others just as Christ forgave us. That is the example as a minister of reconciliation. It's one of service. It's one of put it, putting others before yourself. Don't seek your own interests. Seek the interests of others. That's how we act like ambassadors of Christ and as ministers of reconciliation. It's by showing the world how united the church is, despite our differences, despite however our opinions might misalign with each other at times. We're willing to set aside those insignificant differences for a greater cause, for the cause of the gospel. That is an example as a minister of reconciliation. And then the words of Paul to the church in Corinth can become all the more real. If, if we make those uh, examples a priority in our life, we can then experience what he says here. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Keep in mind who he's talking to. He is talking to a broken church. The Corinthian church was a mess. They were all over the place. Sex scandals and bad theology and unfaithful Christian. I mean, it was just an absolute mess. And Paul helped restore that local body of believers. And on the other side of this restoration, what does he say? Strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace. We have experienced reconciliation with God, and therefore our message needs to be a message of reconciliation. First with God, and then it has to be with each other. We have to be willing to reconcile. Nothing exemplifies the heart of God more than someone willing to do what Jesus did, right? To not count one's sins against another, but to give grace, to forgive and to love. You see, God is making his appeal of salvation to the world, and he's doing it through you, and he's doing it through me. That's quite the responsibility, huh? What an amazing opportunity that you and I have through the end of this Christmas season, sad as that is to say, through the end of 2021, as we head into 2022, to be ambassadors of Christ, to live out God's message of reconciliation that we've been transformed through, then to invite others to embark on that same transformational process so that they don't have to live outside of God's peace anymore. You see, Jesus is currently reigning as the Prince of Peace. He is providing peace with God, peace within our hearts, and inviting us to share that peace with others. And so for one last time uh, in 2021, let's consider the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David 
and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the promise of Christmas. And so we are now, again, I hate to say it. Some people say, no, we don't ever have to be outside of the Christmas season, right? Like Christmas can continue on. Okay, well, if so, then we're going to keep the decorations up. We're going to keep playing Christmas carols all year. I know, brother. I know. Every Sunday. But it's not the decorations and it's not the carols that maintain the Christmas spirit. It's walking in the will of God. It's walking in the peace of God and sharing that message with the world who needs it. You know, as we now spend, what, the last five days of 2021, think back over the last 360 days. Have you experienced peace? And if so, how many of those days were peaceful days to you? Some might say none of them. Some might say nearly all of them. Wherever you are in that, in that spectrum, the promise of Christmas guarantees that no matter what your circumstances are, you can walk in the peace of God daily. This is the most beautiful reality for us to share with the world who is not at peace, who is con continually warring for whatever reasons, because they don't know Jesus. And like the tagline goes, if you don't know Jesus, then you don't know peace. Amen. We're about to uh, join together to sing one last song. This, will, this is called the, the Benediction. And, and what a great song for us as the worship team comes up. What a great song for us as a congregation to leave 2021 with. This will be the last song that we sing as a congregation in this year, right? Um, corporately on a Sunday morning. And this song has been a, a promise to and, and a blessing over God's people for thousands of years. And even Paul picked up on it in 2 Thessalonians 3.16 when he said this, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. That is my prayer is that the Lord is with us in 2022, no matter what happens, no matter where this world wants to go. We can stay fixed on the Lord, and he will keep us in peace.